All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Today, we're gonna take on what I think is probably one of the best fall beers out there. And no, it's not an Oktoberfest, and it is definitely not a pumpkin beer. It is a Vienna Lager. If it's your first time here, I just want to say welcome. Thank you for checking out this channel. Here on my channel, I'll typically either do a grain to glass video like the one you're watching right now, or I'll do a shorter video on various other topics in home brewing. If you like either of those things, please go ahead, hit that subscribe button, but also don't forget to hit that like button as well because YouTube will recommend more of this stuff to you in the future if you do that. So today we're brewing one of my favorite kinds of beer, and uh, to be honest, it's a beer that's long overdue uh, for me to make on this channel, and it's a Vienna Lager. Vienna Lager kind of occupies a strange middle ground between a pale German lager like the Helles Lager and something much more rich and caramely and deeper in color like a Märzen or even a traditional Bach. I think one of the most common and easily found examples of a Vienna Lager here in the United States is none other than Sam Adams Boston Lager, which is, you know, brewed basically in my backyard. A Vienna Lager is a light, sessionable beer at about 5-ish percent ABV, but it has a, um, a lot more malt character and expression and a darker color than most other types of uh, more pale German lagers. It doesn't have the intense sweetness and caramel and melanoidin character, something like a Märzen, Oktoberfest type of beer, or, you know, the traditional Bach if you continue to kind of move up in intensity. The Vienna Lager is going to have kind of like a dark copper to amber appearance, and it's going to be a little bit toasty. The predominant flavor character you should get out of a Vienna Lager is just toastiness and biscuitiness along with a nice subtle uh, German malt background that might include things like Pils or Munich malt. I think it makes one of the best fall beers out there just because it has a really nice balance of sessionable character, so it's a light 5% beer that you can enjoy in hot weather, but at the same time, it has a little bit more flavor and robust maltiness that make it a little bit more enjoyable when that weather starts to get a little bit colder, which is why I like it so much for the fall. I wanted to make this particular beer this time of year because even though I love Oktoberfest and Fest beer and the types of German beers that are almost always getting brewed this time of year, when you have a beer like that on tap at home and when you also have beers like that uh, available at every bar you go to and every brewery you go to, you kind of get inundated with it. It's like everywhere you go there's an Oktoberfest or there's a fest beer of some kind or there's a pumpkin beer and it's just like everybody's got that and it just saturates kind of your taste buds at that point. It gets kind of dull and boring so it's really nice to have still a fall beer but something that's different. And that is really why I wanted to make this particular beer. And also after finishing up my Pilsner series, I wanted nothing more than to brew a darker lager. I loved the Pilsners that I made throughout that series and I had a blast, but uh, after a little while, you kind of want a little bit more color variety. And uh, that's what I wanted out of this beer. So we're going for a slightly darker, more amber version of a Vienna lager today. And I'm really hoping it turns out as pretty as I envisioned it in my head. And another thing we're doing differently in this particular beer that um, I didn't do with any of my Pilsners is uh, we're using a Bavarian lager yeast, the Yeast 2206. And the key difference between this yeast and other lager yeasts that I've been using for the Pilsners is that this yeast does not attenuate as much. It also produces loads of diacetyl. And the effect of that is, as we ferment this as a traditional lager, it's gonna give it a little bit more roundness, but also a tremendous amount more maltiness in the finished beer. And that is exactly what I am looking for in a Vienna lager. I'm using just over an ounce of hops in this particular brew and, uh, that should tell you everything you need to know about what way the flavor leans. It's going to be very, very malty. Before we get too much further, I want to thank Northern Brewer for providing me the ingredients for this particular batch of beer. They've been actually providing me the ingredients for many batches of beer up to this point, and I'm very grateful to them for that. If you haven't heard already, Northern Brewer is no longer owned by AB InBev or Anheuser-Busch. They have been in business for over 28 years, which is a little bit longer than I've been alive, and they have a tremendous wealth of knowledge uh, and resources at their disposal. So Northern 
Brewer is a fantastic place to go for instructions on how to start home brewing. They have a variety of starter kits that I highly recommend if you want to get into the hobby, but also they have top of the line equipment and fantastic ingredient selections as well. So if you're looking to order the ingredients to your next batch of beer, or you're looking for a new piece of home brewing equipment, or you're just looking to learn about home brewing or even get started, check out the link I've dropped in the description box or go over to northernbrewer.com and check out what they have to offer. I'm sure you will not be disappointed. So now we're going to go ahead and jump into the recipe section for this video. We're going to start out with five pounds of Weyermann Vienna malt. Uh, Vienna malt is liqueur of a Vienna lager. Beyond that, it's a malt that essentially is somewhere between Munich malt and Pilsner malt in terms of toast and also in terms of color. Um, it is a lightly toasted malt that gives you a slightly darker color than Pilsner malt and uh, a lot more flavor in terms of nuttiness and toastiness than uh, your typical um, Pilsner malt would or pale malt. Um, but on top of that, we're going to add four pounds of Weyermann Bark Munich malt. That is going to help contribute to color. It's also going to help contribute to toastiness as well. Um, but it gives you another layer of complexity on top of just the single Vienna malt. Vienna malt is delicious by itself, but when paired with Munich malt, it's uh, just even bigger of a treat. Right, on top of that, we're going to add two pounds of Weyermann Bark Pilsner malt. Um, this is just leftover from the other brews that I've been doing with the Weyermann Bark Pilsner. I really enjoyed using their, their Bark Pilsner malts over the last several times I made a Pilsner on this channel. Um, it does have a little bit different character than your standard Weyermann malt. And lastly, to round everything off and to get this into the sort of darker amber color range that we want out of this, we're adding just a quarter pound of Weyermann Dehusked Carafa 2. Uh, this is a roasted malt that has been dehusked, so it doesn't have as much astringency as a typical roasted malt. Carafa malts are one of my favorite options for adding color to any type of beer. Uh, just a little tiny bit is all it takes, and um, it really doesn't add roasty flavor unless you're really adding a, a whole bunch. So for hops, this beer is extremely light on hops. We're adding a half ounce of Magnum to bitter at 60 minutes. And then we're adding one ounce of Saz just before the end at about five minutes. And that is just gonna give us a little tiny bit of hop character in there to balance out all the sweet maltiness, but it should definitely have a decent bias towards maltiness. Hence, only an ounce and a half of hops are actually in this entire brew. For yeast, like I mentioned before, we're gonna be using Y-Yeast 2206 Bavarian Lager Yeast. Um, and this is a lager yeast that is gonna best behave at lager temperatures. We'll be doing a classic lager fermentation with this particular beer. And 2206 tends to not attenuate um, as much as many other lager yeasts, especially not as much as the uh, 3470 that I'm so fond of. Um, and it, that's gonna give us a little bit residual sweetness, a little bit higher finishing gravity. It's also gonna give us a little bit of diacinol, a little bit rounder of an overall mouthfeel in the uh, final beer. And that's actually something I want in this particular type of beer. For the water profile, we're definitely making a big change from the Pilsners I've been brewing. So a lot of people will recommend you go for the Munich water profile that's listed out there. I would not recommend that type of thing for anything lighter than a Dunkel lager. You really do want to have a little less hardness in there. Many Munich brewers, if they were making a lighter beer like a Helles lager or an Oktoberfest or in this case, a Vienna style lager, um, they would actually pre-boil their water. So that would get rid of a lot of the carbonates in there and that would give you a little bit different of a water profile. It's gonna be a little bit more friendly towards your lighter types of beer. And while I'm not gonna pre-boil my water here, I am starting with distilled water and I'm gonna target a water profile that has less bicarbonate than the uh, typical Munich water profile does, but still a reasonable amount of minerals in there. And this is gonna give us a significantly more malty beer um, and a little bit more full feeling mouthfeel, I believe, uh, if I do it right. <laughs> um, and hopefully it gives you the exact same experience if you wanna use this water profile. So we'll be doing a water profile of 44 parts per million of calcium, six parts per million of magnesium, 84 parts per million of chloride, 44 parts per million of sulfate, and 47 parts per million of bicarbonate. Um, and I just kind of want to point out the sodium content in there is going to help give this a lot more roundness of mouthfeel as well. So in order to get this water profile, we are going to add the following to eight gallons of distilled water. One gram of gypsum, two grams of epsom, one gram of sodium chloride, four grams of calcium chloride, and two grams of baking soda. Uh, so a lot more than we're used to with our delicate Pilsner water profiles, right? 
for the mash on this one, we're gonna keep it simple. Um, I could step mash this, I suppose, if I wanted to, but i um, trying to get done with the brew day today a little bit quicker than I typically do. Uh, so we're gonna do a single infusion mash for 60 minutes at 152 Fahrenheit. Um, otherwise, I probably would have step mashed this one if I wasn't you know, hurrying a little bit, um, but it's still not gonna be a big deal. Anyway, our water is all up to temperature now, so let's go ahead and dough in. Once the strike water in my claw hammer supply 120 volt system reached my mash in temperature, I mashed in with a grain bill, being sure to break up any clumps I had in the mash. Then I started recirculating. I let the mash sit for about 10 minutes before taking a pH measurement and I saw an on target pH of 5.53. I really like this new Apera pH pen, by the way. Uh, I bought that to replace my broken beverage doctor pH pen. Then I let the mash sit for about 60 minutes at 152 degrees Fahrenheit. Then I raised the mash out temperature of 170. After reaching the mash out temperature, I let it stay there for about 15 minutes and then I pulled out the grain basket and let that drain also for about another 15 minutes. Once the water was underway, I set the controller to 100% power to get a jump start on my boil. I recorded a measurement of 11.2 bricks or about 1044, which was only about two points lower than my target pre-boil gravity. Once I reached my boil, I added my 60 minute bittering addition, which was half an ounce of Magnum, and then I let the boil go for another 45 minutes, uh, which put me at about 15 minutes from the end. At that point, I added a Whirlflock tablet, I added some yeast nutrient, and I also began recirculating boiling wort through my chiller in order to sanitize it. And uh, this is just the method that I prefer to sanitize my chiller and my pump, because uh, it's all boiling temperature. Then about 10 minutes later, I added my five minute hop addition, which was one ounce of saws. At this point, I began to chill down to about 70 Fahrenheit. I took a original gravity sample and I recorded a gravity of 13 bricks or about 1051, which was three points lower than my target gravity. And at that point, I aerated with pure oxygen for about a minute. and then I pitched my yeast and left it to ferment. So for the fermentation on this beer, uh, I'm gonna be actually going down the typical lager route. So we'll be looking at about a 50 degree fermentation temperature for probably about two to three weeks of actual fermentation time. Bavarian lager yeast really does benefit a lot from having the actual traditional lager fermentation because it has kind of a unique mouthfeel to it. Um, and that's not a component of yeast expression that we really look into all that much. For the most part, we look to either our mash temperature and our residual sugars, um, as well as our water profile for influencing mouthfeel the most. But actually, fermentation does have a small impact on that. And the biggest way that this particular yeast has an impact on it is the same way that English strains do, that is through the generation of diacetyl. A small amount of diacetyl in a malty beer is actually gonna make it feel fuller in the mouth. And that is something that we're actually gonna try and target here. We don't want so much diacetyl that it turns into a diacetyl bomb and you can taste the butter flavor and, and all that. That is bad juju, we don't want that. But when it comes down to the mouthfeel, it does increase the perception of body and that's about where we want to put it. The best way to get a little extra bit of diacetyl out of your fermentation is to ferment it as a traditional lager. You know, after our primary fermentation is complete, we will still do a diacetyl rest until I cannot taste the diacetyl, but this yeast is not going to clean up all of the diacetyl that it generates uh, before it flocculates out, and that is going to result in a beer with a little bit more body. However, there are a variety of other ways to make this lager. If you're not looking at keeping it uh, super, uh, historically correct, which is totally fine, um, or you're looking at doing this kind of as a more how quickly can I get beer option, I'd look into Lutra Quike, uh, which is actually going to be the complete opposite end of the fermentation spectrum. You're gonna ferment that as hot as you can get it to about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and you will get a lager clean beer after like three or four days of fermentation, and you'll be drinking this thing within a week. Um, it's a amazing yeast, it's fantastic, it's super clean, 
but you're not going to get the specific contributions that you would get from using something like the Bavarian Lager yeast in this particular beer. And you're definitely not going to get the diacetyl and roundness that you'd get with a 2206. Another option, of course, is also the dry yeast, the uh, W3470 that I like to use. However, that's going to attenuate further. Uh, the 3470, every time I use it, has tended to get my beers like pretty dry for a lager. They've gotten below 1010 more often than they have not, um, which is really surprising, but it's honestly a pretty aggressive fermenter. Um, and if you give it the right conditions for it, especially if you ferment it a little bit warmer, you're gonna get drier beers out of it. That's not necessarily a bad thing in a Vienna lager because it is a toasty beer, it's not a sweet beer. Um, so if it does end up a little bit on the dry side, that's okay but you're also gonna get a little bit different of a lager character out of that, and you might get a little bit of sulfur, especially if you ferment it a bit warm. If you don't have access to the 2206, there's also Y-Use 2308 Munich Lager, uh, which is gonna give you a pretty similar result, to be honest. Um, I've used that many times before, and it's a, it's a pretty solid yeast. And last but certainly not least, there's also the option to use something like the German Ale Strain, the Y-Use 1007, uh, which is gonna give you the ability to ferment at about 60 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and that'll give you a very clean fermenting beer as well. Um, it might take a while to flocculate out and become lager clean. It's actually a pretty good option if you don't have the ability to get your fermentation cold enough to ferment a lager traditionally. I'll be fermenting this in my Spike CF5 for no other reason than that is the only fermenter I have available at the moment. Um, I will be using my Anvil Bucket for some other upcoming brews. Stay tuned for that. But the Vienna Lager is a pretty good option to use a bucket for. You're not opening up that fermenter. You're not dry hopping it. You're not doing anything that's going to risk oxidation, so you don't really have a need to do anything other than ferment in a single vessel and then transfer into a keg, which is what that fermenter does really, really well. And lastly, if you want to ferment this one under pressure, it's a great candidate to do that. If you want to use like a firmzilla or a, you know, unit tank type fermenter, then go for it by all means. Let me know if you do that and let me know how it turns out for you. In a nutshell, what we'll be doing is fermenting this one, uh, not under pressure, but at about 50 degrees Fahrenheit for probably about two weeks until it's completed its primary phase of fermentation and the yeast have dropped out a little bit. And then we're gonna raise it up to room temperature for a diacetyl rest of about three to five days, uh, depending on how strong this yeast actually kicks out diacetyl. At that point, we will transfer into the keg. We will add gelatin findings once it gets cold in order to uh, help accelerate the flocculation of the yeast and clarify the beer faster. And uh, once it's looking nice and clean and clear, we'll go ahead and put it on tap and uh, we'll talk about it. So it's gonna be a couple weeks before this one gets done, but hopefully it'll be out by the end of October. And uh, if that's the case, I'll see you guys then. Final gravity on the Vienna Lager is actually about 1010. That's right about where the base of the line is. And it is looking like a nice, beautiful beer. So I'm really excited to get this lagering. All right, so the time has come to get this beer poured. It is mid-October, which is the perfect time to drink a beer like this. So a little bit of a teaser for you guys here. I actually harvested the yeast from this batch using my conical, and I'm saving off two mason jars of it for future German lagers. So get ready for some Bavarian lagers coming your way in the future. Uh, as soon as we get a little bit colder, I'm very excited to kind of get some of these going. I've been on a lager kick ever since I started the Pilsner series, and turns out it's still going. It's been lagering for about three weeks in the keg, and actually an interesting thing to, to point out with this beer is that it didn't really clarify 100%. Whether that is a protein haze from the malts that I chose, or from uh, just the generic chill haze, I don't really know, but it is three weeks old in the keg. At this point, I've added cold side findings, and it's getting better, but it's just one of those beers that's not going to be completely ready um, for probably another four or five weeks. It's not worth waiting until it clarifies because I want to give this to you guys as a fall recipe, and I can't wait until the end of November for it to actually be ready. So what we're going to do is just kind of drive on with what we have, which is a 60% clear beer. And appearance aside, this beer tastes awesome, and I'm very excited to share it with you. So let's go ahead and pour it. So the beer is called Toastmaster, uh, and it comes in at 5.4% ABV and 23 IBUs. All right, so for appearance of the beer, it's pouring an absolutely beautiful reddish brown color, which uh, is a little bit hazy as I discussed earlier, but it's getting a little bit better. Um, 
It also has a really nice beige head on it, which is nice and fluffy. Um, it does have good structure. It also leaves a good layer um, on the surface of the beer and uh, also has good lacing. I'm really very happy with the appearance of it. I think my favorite beer appearance is really amber beers. Uh, they're just absolutely gorgeous. So yes, I'm well aware that this is the wrong kind of glassware for this particular style. This is a vice beer glass. I like the way they look. I like the way the beers look in the glass, and that's why I chose it. Glassware Nazis, you can come fight me. It doesn't get enough love because I don't brew enough vice beer. So now we'll talk about aroma. The aroma is nice. It's a semi-sweet maltiness. Um, there's a little bit of that toast in there. There's a little bit of that kind of Munich malt character. It smells honestly a lot like freshly milled Munich malt, um, and that makes a lot of sense considering that's a big part of the ingredients. Um, Munich and Vienna malt, uh, which are toasted, and that's kind of where you get that toastiness from. There's a small amount of spice character in the aroma as well, uh, which is it's, it's a, a nice accent. So next let's go in for mouthfeel and my first swig. The mouthfeel on this one is very much a solid medium. Um, there is, <laughs> yeah, very generic. It's not as heavy as some other malty beers out there. It's definitely retaining its drinkability, um, but it's also not light at all. It's a very round character. Um, it's not nearly as delicate as those Pilsners that I've been brewing all summer long, but it's also not nearly as light as them either. It's not thin, it's not lacking body in any way, um, quite the opposite. And it's definitely not as thick as something like perhaps a Bach might be. Um, I think the maltiness and the body really do line up very well. Um, I think it's about right for this particular style. There's a little bit of roundness in there from a little tiny bit of diacetyl from the yeast that I really kind of wanted in there just to kind of balance things out. It is a, a definitive characteristic of those Munich lagers, um, and it is kind of important to have that in there. I think it adds a lot. So hopefully if the Yellow Jackets leave me alone, I can talk about flavor. Hmm. Yeah, this is a good beer. This is a really good beer. Um, I'm very happy with the flavor on this one. It's actually quite complicated. Um, for a multi, it is first of all really nice to have a nice darker multi beer uh, after brewing all those Pilsners all summer long. I love Pilsners, they're wonderful, but sometimes it's nice to have something a bit more malty. And um, this is really filling that role quite well. It's really toasty. Uh, the prominent character in this is toastiness and bread crust and a little tiny bit of kind of not quite a caramel sweetness. It's not really sweetness. I'd say it's more of a melanoidin character. Um, it's not got that cloying caramel sweetness that you can get in these beers if you overdo it. It kind of just fools your mind into thinking this is a sweeter beer than it is. I guess you would say it's more of, I guess it's more of like a molasses-y toffee kind of note, but it's it's a hint of it. It's not, not actually like a prominent flavor. There is just enough bitterness in this to balance it out nicely. It's not overdone. I'm getting like toastiness, uh, toasted nuts, like a hazelnut almost, like biscuit flavor, a little tiny bit of honey, a little tiny bit of toffee, a little tiny, tiny bit of caramel. It is a really complex beer and I'm really enjoying it. Um, there's definitely some bread crust in there, but not as much as like a dunkel. It's definitely a flaw in this beer to have too much sweetness. Uh, if you're not careful, that toastiness can get away from you and it can turn into sweetness and you don't necessarily want that. It is just the right kind of beer for the change in seasons. As you can tell right now, I'm outside, I'm in a t-shirt. It's warm. It's like 75 degrees right now. But later in the day, it'll decrease down to probably about 50, 60 degrees at night. It's the perfect time to have this beer because it's robust and it, it holds up to the colder temperatures. It has that complexity that is, um, kind of desired this time of year, but it also has the drinkability and the low ABV to be enjoyed outside in, you know, the warmer temperatures of the day. It is a decidedly malty beer and, you know, there is no expectation of hop character to come through in this, uh, but if it were me, I probably would have liked to increase the size a little bit on this one to get a little bit more spice at the end. It is just always nice to have that in most German beers, actually. Hopefully this yellow jacket will let me talk about the yeast selection for the beer without stinging me. You realize how much time I've lost talking about the beer with these, oh, damn it. I was about to take another sip, but uh,
anyway, um, <laughs> I want to talk about the yeast selection for this beer. The 2206 Bavarian Lager yeast is a lot different because it leaves a lot more diacetyl. Like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, that actually had the effects that I wanted it to have. Uh, it gave a little bit more roundness to the mouthfeel, and there is a small amount of diacetyl contribution on the back end of the palate. So what we have here is not a traditional buttery diacetyl flavor if you have too much diacetyl, uh, but instead it's a tasteful amount that actually enhances the richness of some of the malt flavors. And what we get out of that is a little bit of kind of that faux sweetness, that faux richness um, from the caramel and from the uh, toffee kind of flavors. It actually works very, very well in this style of beer. You'll also see that in a lot of other Munich-based lagers. I think the Polaner Helles Lager is actually a great example of that. Uh, it has a significant amount of diacetyl in it, uh, which is actually manifested quite tastefully, and it's actually very good. So there are a few things I would like to do differently with this brew if I were to make it again. The first thing would be actually an increase in the amount of melanoidin character, and that means either boiling it for a longer period of time or performing a decoction mash, which not everybody has time for, but it is how these are traditionally made. Um, or, you know, adding in maybe half a pound of melanoid malt. The richness is an important flavor. I don't think it needs nearly as much as a traditional Bach or like a Doppelbach, something like that. Um, but it is a nice dimension to the flavor that I would like to see a little bit more of. The second thing is more of a personal taste. I would like to see a bit more spice um, out of this. That means maybe adding in more saws at the zero minute or um, maybe adding in a little bit of like a rye malt. A lot of recipes out there for Vienna lagers actually uh, suggest substituting chocolate rye malt for the Carafa 2, uh, for the color edition, and that actually adds a small amount of spiciness to the whole thing. This is a beer that I would really enjoy seeing a lot more spice in. Um, it would hold up to that very well. That being said, it's very easy to go overboard on that. You don't want this to be a Rogan beer, um, so the rye malt edition should be very subtle. Really the perfect beer for this time of year for me. It's definitely different than the Mertzens that we have everywhere. It's not quite the fest beer kind of thing. Um, it's just something completely different. And obviously it's not a pumpkin beer. Um, so anyway, guys, I really hope you enjoyed the video. And if you learned something, please hit that like button. If you like this content, please subscribe for more of it. And if you want to support the channel, there's a number of ways to do so. I would really appreciate it if you bought a t-shirt like this one uh, that is available down in the merch store down below the description box. Also, if you want to support the channel on a more personal basis, I have a Patreon, which is listed in the description box as well. And if you're in the market for some home brewing equipment, I also have a uh, Amazon store, which is full of all of the equipment that I use on the regular to brew with. So every single piece of equipment on that store comes with my personal endorsement because I use it all the time. If you want to follow me on more than just YouTube, I'm also active on Instagram as The Apartment Brewer, and you'll see slightly more frequent content updates on Instagram than YouTube. Thank you very much to my Patreon supporters. You guys are doing amazing things for this channel and I really am appreciative of your efforts and your support. If you're still watching at this point, you guys have my utmost thanks and seriously, the watch time does matter a lot. So this one's for you guys. Until the next one, cheers.